Hi everybody, it's Pastor Mark here. Welcome you to online worship at East Brady Baptist Church for the week of April 17th, 2022. Hey, it's Easter and for that we celebrate. Let us start our celebration by looking to our call to worship. We do not look for the living among the dead. Christ the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us worship our risen Savior. Alleluia. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, you are our faithful God and worthy to be praised. Today we celebrate the most significant day in all of human history. On Easter Sunday, 2,000 years ago, you miraculously achieved the impossible with the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet we often live our daily lives as if the tomb were not empty. We often walk in denial and fail to welcome the new life you so graciously have given. We confess our sins of indifference and faithlessness Forgive our fear and doubt. Deepen our faith through Christ's resurrection power to live our lives fully for the one who died and rose again for us. We pray this in the name of our precious risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I really have uh, no uh, announcements uh, for today uh, other than, hey, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, won't you go ahead and use the comments section to, to just make a comment or two there so that we can know that you are with us and, and let us know how you're doing today. And also you can leave prayer requests there as well. And, and we'll, we as a church family will see that and we'll continue to pray all for one another. Uh, so just use the comments uh, for those purposes. We love to hear from you. So let's move on to our time of scripture and teaching. Our scripture today is taken from John chapter 20, starting at verse 1. So if you've got a Bible, you've got an electronic device you use to read your Bible, and won't you open it up to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 20. I'm going to start reading to you from verse 1. And as usual, hey, online, we will put the words of our scriptures up on the screen for you. At John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she wept. She bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one on uh, the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you were looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading and hearing of his holy word. Oh, great, great account, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, for our teaching today, let me uh, just start by pointing out that, hey, wait, sometimes way back when, some of you know this, I used to be a newspaper reporter. And as such, every once in a while, my editor would give me a call. Now, I always uh, found it humorous that my editor's name was Mark Mann. So when we talked about him formally, we, we talked about Mr. Mann. So it was funny. Yeah, I worked for Mr. Mann. I worked for the Mann, folks. 
But he would sometimes come and he would say, hey, we received a, a police report about such and such a thing that happened. There aren't a whole lot of details here. We want you to go find out the details of what happened. And so they would tell me to go just go knock on random doors in the area or, or go to the local, local grocery store and just harass people there pretty much. Things like that. And I hated doing that. But hey, it was my job. And, and so I did it. And what I was really doing, what they sent me to do was find eyewitnesses, people who had been there whenever whatever had happened had actually happened. And the goal when you're a good reporter is to find several eyewitnesses who would make the, the same claims or add details that others had so you could piece the details together to get that full story. You could find the truth of what had happened. See, when you're looking for eyewitnesses, the objective is to find people who are reliable. Most of us have seen those humorous clips from new shows on TV. They just slap whatever idiot they can find on the camera to talk about whatever. And we laugh. We watch it over and over again. It gets them good ratings. But it's lousy journalism. You really don't know really what had happened there. To do the job right, you need to find reliable eyewitnesses, which is sometimes difficult. But even though it may be difficult, finding credible witnesses is necessary because how else are you going to know what happened since you yourself were not there? You have to ask somebody. Folks, it's Easter. I love Easter. It's the day we celebrate with joy Jesus rising from the dead. But I bring up all this stuff about reliable witnesses and eyewitnesses because there are many people out there who sadly don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe it happened. And one of their main reasons for doing so is because, well, they weren't there to see it. And so their question is, how can I believe something that supposedly happened 2,000 years ago? I wasn't there. It sounds fantastic. Oh, I didn't see it, so I'm not going to believe it. How can you expect me to believe that? The answer to their question is the same thing I did as a newspaper reporter. You look to the eyewitness accounts. There were Many, many eyewitnesses to the resurrection, people who saw the proof themselves that they were either at the empty tomb and or they saw the resurrected Jesus and they interacted with him. We read actually in 1 Corinthians that over 500 people were witnesses to the resurrection. That's a lot of witnesses, folks. Our passage out of John today gives us three of those witnesses. Right? First, we, we get Mary Magdalene, uh, who was a follower of Jesus, out of whom Jesus had earlier cast seven demons, and she had been following him ever since. That first Easter morning, she's, she's uh, grieving, so she went to visit the tomb to find the sto stone rolled away from the entrance, and no body was in there. So Mary rushes to tell the disciples, quote, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. She says we, because the other gospel writers make sure we know there were some other women with Mary when this was discovered. But Mary Magdalene, she is the first, she just here, she gives the first eyewitness account. And John records her witness for us here in his gospel. Mary later returns to the tomb and she's upset because Jesus' body is gone and they don't know uh, what's going on. At which point she is met by the living Jesus. Now she doesn't recognize him at first, and I can't blame her, would you? I mean, of all the people she might think would come up and start a conversation with her in this garden where all the tombs were, Jesus, whom she had watched die a brutal death three days earlier, probably not one of them. She doesn't recognize it's Jesus, but when Jesus says her name, he says, Mary, she recognizes that voice. And Jesus himself had said, my sheep, my followers know my voice. And so Mary does. She turns and she finally sees Jesus. It's the risen Jesus standing in front of her. So, so Mary, she, she goes and tells the disciples that too. She again is an eyewitness. She is the first eyewitness of these events of the resurrection. But our passage out of John chapter 20 also gives us two other witnesses here. We are told that Peter and the other disciple, and that's John, who was the writer. It's just a cloaked way of him referring to himself when he's writing. We are told that Peter and the other disciple, John, they run to the tomb after hearing Mary's report, and they find it just as she has said. The stones rolled away. There's no body, just some burial clothes neatly placed where they should be, I guess. And then John's gospel, along with the other gospels, they go on to tell us 
that the living Jesus later that day appeared to all the disciples, including Peter and John. So in this passage out of John 20 alone, we have three eyewitnesses to the resurrection, Mary, Peter, and John. So we got our eyewitnesses. We got to mind them. Now let's find, let's look at their story. What do they say happened? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? I wasn't there. You weren't there. We need a testimony of eyewitnesses. What do they say? Well, unfortunately, we don't really have anything else from Mary Magdalene other than what we get in our passage today in John 20. And that's secondhand through John. I mean, John says Mary gave this witness, this testimony. But we do uh, get something more from the other two witnesses, Peter and John. Now, John, he's the author of the gospel of John. So the entire gospel is John's testimony about Jesus, including our passage today. So certainly here, John is testifying that the tomb was empty that morning and that Jesus was risen from the dead. And that later that evening, he had seen and spoken with the living Jesus. That's John's testimony. It's pretty clear. Peter didn't pen his own gospel, although many scholars believe that Mark, when Mark was writing his gospel, he got the information for, for that from Peter. So they say that's kind of close to Peter's gospel, but we don't know that. So we have to do a little more work to uncover Peter's eyewitness testimony regarding the resurrection. But even so, it's pretty easy. I mean, thanks in part to Dr. Luke. We know Luke wrote the gospel of Luke, but he also wrote its follow-up account, the book of Acts, what the believers of Jesus did after Jesus had risen and ascended to heaven. So in the book of Acts, Luke records Peter standing with John, not once, but twice before the Jewish ruling council to answer for their teaching about Jesus. You see, these men who had had Jesus killed, they didn't like that his followers were now teaching other people about him now. So they arrest Peter and John for talking about Jesus, and they demand that they make a defense. And in answering their objections, both times in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5, Peter testifies that Jesus had risen from the dead. Acts chapter 5, verse 30 and 32, this is what Peter says, The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. We are witnesses of these things. See, Peter's testimony from his own mouth is that, yes, Jesus was raised from the dead. And he said, we are witnesses of these things. Oh, I saw these things with my own eyes. I am an eyewitness. I experienced these things. That's his testimony. But lest someone think, well, that's just maybe Luke putting words into Peter's mouth. Maybe Peter didn't really say that. Well, we also have in our New Testament letters actually written by Peter, aptly named 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Peter writes these letters, and in these letters, Peter himself testifies once more that Jesus rose from the dead. Hey, 1 Peter 1, 3, Peter writes, Praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the the dead. Peter praises God because uh, Peter has hope. He's got a living hope. His hope is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He writes that there. There, he testifies to this truth once again. Jesus was raised from the dead. That's his testimony. So wh wh when we uh, look at John chapter 20, we see in that just that short passage alone, we are given three eyewitnesses. Two of the witnesses, Peter and John, were there, and we have greater testimony from them, and their testimony matches. The question now is, are these two reliable witnesses? Because remember, we don't want unreliable witnesses. No one's going to believe that. Mark Twain once joked, nothing spoils a good story like the arrival of eyewitnesses. So you, you, you can make up a pretty good story and you can go along with it and people might be entertained by it a lot. And, but that's what you have. You've got a story. But when a reliable eyewitness shows up, anything that you added or, or, or made up, they get to the bottom of that real fast because what you get from a reliable eyewitness is the truth. So can we trust Peter and John as reliable eyewitnesses to uncover the truth? Well, in a word, yes. There are multiple reasons I would say that, but I want to talk to you about just one today. 
See, Peter and John are reliable witnesses because they, along with the other apostles, they endured torture rather than recanting and saying that the resurrection was a lie. I want you to think about it. If you're telling me something and I decide I don't want to hear what you're saying, I want to hear the opposite, I might hold a gun to your head and demand that you otherwise uh, say something different or I'll shoot. Now, if you were lying about what you were saying in the first place, of course, at the threat of death, you're going to tell the truth. You're just going to say, yeah, I was just, I was just wasn't saying what was true. But in fact, even if you were telling the truth at the threat of death, you very well may take it back anyway to preserve your life. When someone's threatening your life, you'll say whatever it is they want you to say, unless it's really important. See, the apostles, including Peter and John, they refused to change their testimony, even when they were tortured and when their lives were put on the line. See, if it were a lie, they would have fessed up to it. There was nothing in it for them to propagate the lie, particularly when their lives were threatened for telling it. No, they they keep to it because it's what actually happened, and it was life-changing. Tradition tells us that most of the apostles were killed for refusing to say the resurrection was a lie. And take John. Well, we don't know specifically how John died. We do know from the Bible that in his later years, John was exiled to the island of Patmos for his faith. So uh, at the very least, because he wouldn't recant Jesus, he was exiled, right? Tradition suggests, though, that before his exile, John's enemies attempted to kill him. See, because John's continued commitment to Jesus, his enemies threw him into boiling acid, But John was miraculously saved. And it was after that that John was then sentenced to slave labor on Patmos, during which time he continued in his devotion to Christ. And and that's when he had his vision of heaven that is recorded for us in what we call the book of Revelation. Uh, But whether the, the boiling acid stuff is true or not, John suffered and he endured it all because he wouldn't change his testimony regarding the resurrection of Jesus. Why would he continue to lie if it weren't true? Well, what about Peter? Well, the most commonly accepted church tradition is that Peter was crucified upside down in Rome for his testimony about Jesus. See, tradition says that when Peter was put to death, he requested to be crucified on an inverted cross. Because you may recall, before Jesus' death, the night before it, Peter had denied knowing Jesus three times. So he didn't feel worthy to die in the same manner of his Lord Jesus Christ, who he had previously denied. But get this, Peter went from being that man who denied even knowing Jesus three times, he denied it over and over again, he went from being that to enduring a suffering death rather than denying Jesus again. What happened? Something had changed in Peter. That something was the resurrection. Peter, we know from from what we read in the gospel, he wasn't the type of person who would have held to the claim of Jesus' resurrection. He would have chickened out unless it were true. Certainly, if he had been just making it up (laughs) at the threat of death, he would have recanted. The fact that these men and many others of the eyewitnesses, that they held to their testimony through torture and under the threat of death, that just supports their reliability. They've got no reason to lie. But we come back to the truth that some people sadly choose not to believe that the resurrection took place. And the only way to deny the resurrection is to actually deny the reliable and consistent testimony of so many eyewitnesses, including Peter and John and Mary Magdalene. Their testimony proves the truth. Jesus died and rose again. And and I'm so glad he did. It's just great news, right? We celebrate that news joyfully each Easter and indeed every day because this is the centerpiece of our faith. This is what gives us hope. This is what gives us joy. And this is what we look forward to for eternal peace. And it's what spurs love among us. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Your sins, my sins, we've all got sin. Jesus died on the cross to pay for that. that. And, And then Jesus rose from the grave. Jesus rose to life to prove that his sacrifice was enough. It covers our sins. 
and also to declare that there truly is life in him, eternal life. You'd look to Jesus and you'll be free of your sins and you'll have eternal life with God. That's what the resurrection means. And that's why it gives us hope. I want you to, to listen to one final word of testimony from Peter who spoke of Jesus when he and John were being persecuted for healing a crippled man in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verse 10, uh, Peter says, Know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, see there's his testimony again, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by mankind by which we must be saved. Peter tells the authorities, and he says it's for all the people too. He says God raised Jesus from the dead. And then Peter indicates God did it for a purpose. To, to bring, to announce salvation. Peter declares that there is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. There's no other way to heaven, folks. There's no other way to eternal life. There's no other means of eternal forgiveness for the things that we have done wrong. You can trust in your own self. Yeah, you can trust in your own goodness, your own good deeds. You can, you can think positive thoughts and positive vibes all you want. But that gets you nowhere. Peter, the reliable witness, tells us here that Jesus was raised to life to save us. And he's the only one. He is the only way. Jesus saves you. He brings you salvation. You receive salvation. You are saved only by placing your faith in Christ alone. And the great thing is, as Peter says, I tell all the people, it's for all the people. Jesus extends his salvation to all who will come to him in faith. Faith that is authenticated by turning from your sin turning from your own way of life and instead living for Jesus. That's faith. Faith in the ability of Jesus to save you by the power of his resurrection. This is the truth of Easter that we celebrate today and we celebrate it every day. If you have not yet come to Christ in faith, won't you do so today? What a great day to believe the testimony of so many witnesses. Turn from your sin, turn to Jesus and be saved and live. And to all of you, everyone out there, because of these things we've talked about here, I want you all to go and celebrate. For by faith, we too shall all be risen indeed in the name of Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. To God, our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for giving us your Son, Jesus Christ. And, and God, though we may look at the events of Good Friday and the events leading up to it, and there's much sorrow there, God, uh, we come back to Easter, which is the day of victory, the day uh, of proven victory when your Son, Jesus Christ, gives us hope by rising from the dead. God, we thank you for giving us this great sign that, that lets us know, yes, Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, he is able to give life. Yes, he does master death for us. God, I, I pray for anybody out there who has not uh, before uh, made that decision to trust in your Son, Jesus Christ, and to follow him in faith, that, that you would change their heart today by your Holy Spirit and move them to faith, God. May they be faithful followers in Jesus Christ and be welcomed into your eternal kingdom and, and that they might have eternal life. But God, let us be joyful today and all days as your children. We always remember the hope we have in the resurrection of Christ. We pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, we come to the end of our Easter worship service online. I am so glad that you could join us. Hey, uh, won't you consider, if you're able to get out and about and if you're in the area, won't you consider joining us in person Sundays at 10.30 a.m. for worship? Uh, but we will also continue to offer our online worship services in the, in the weeks ahead. Uh, we are going to conclude our service today by singing the great Easter hymn, He Lives. But first, won't you receive the blessing? May the grace of Christ our Savior, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen.